Now, I might explain, two years ago, I came to this study, and I think on the second night of us here, there were several of us that were back there in the entrance way, and we were visiting like we do before the service, and Brother Clint was there. And at some point, Clint looked at me and he said, Billy, the topic that I want you to take next year is whether or not the guilty party has the right to remarry. And the first words that came out of my mouth, and I think Clint probably remembers this, I said, you got to be kidding. That's what I said to him. And I think the reason I had that reaction was because as far as I'm concerned, this is the most controversial topic that I've been given so far in this particular study. And so it kind of took me by surprise, I said, or by surprise. So I said, you've got to be kidding. And Clint said, no. He said, you know, this is something that needs to be dealt with. It needs to be preached on from time to time. He said, will you take it? And I said, well, I guess so. And he said, good. That's what I want to hear. Well, you know, I went home, or not home, I went to where I was staying uh, that evening, and I thought about the topic. And the next day, I thought more on it. And finally, I got together again with Clint, and I said, Clint, I want to explain something to you. I said, I'm going to take this particular topic about the guilty party, but I said, I want you to understand that I'm going to have to deal with more than just that. I'm going to have to deal with the issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage really in a comprehensive way before I can get to this one particular aspect. And I've said all of that so that you'll understand that that is the case. We're going to deal with the guilty party aspect of it but there's some other ground, first of all, I think that we need to cover. There's something else that I want to acknowledge this evening, and that is, obviously, this is an emotionally charged issue. And it really is. When you get to talking about divorce and remarriage, some people get all emotional about it. And I think the reason is because this is something that touches the lives of people, and you know what, when you think about it, probably practically every family, every family at one time somewhere down the line has to deal with this particular issue and is affected by it. And so that's the reason why that it is so emotionally charged. But what I want to exhort you to do this evening is this. Let's lay aside our emotions as best as we can and any preconceived opinions that we might have and let's approach this subject like we would any other topic in the Bible. And that is we want to just simply go to the Word of God and see exactly what is taught therein, learn the truth on it, and once we do that, simply take our stand upon the Word of God. Before I actually launch into a discussion of Christ's law on this particular subject, I do want to give some emphasis to the sanctity of marriage. Although probably I don't need to do that because Alan did a wonderful job in emphasizing that. But let me just briefly say it again. And that is from a scriptural standpoint, when we view marriage as we Christians view it, then we recognize that marriage is a relationship governed by the law of God. And as Alan so ably showed us, marriage is a covenant which we enter into, Malachi 2 and verse 14 talks about the wife of thy covenant. And let me remind you that our God, the God that we serve, is a covenant making and He is a covenant keeping God. And as has already been stressed, when we enter into a covenant, God expects us to be faithful and true in regard to that. And so now with that in mind, let's notice what Jesus declared in Matthew 5 and verses 31 and verse 32. Of course, in the great sermon on the mount, Jesus said, It hath been said that whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. I believe that in the Sermon on the Mount, 
that Jesus is setting forth the principles by which his kingdom is going to be governed. And incidentally, if you'll read the Sermon on the Mount, I think it's at least eight times you'll see that Jesus makes reference to his kingdom. And so I believe that Jesus here is setting forth his law on divorce and remarriage because after all, the law of Moses never did say except it be for fornication. I want to emphasize that. You're not going to find that in the law of Moses. And that being the case, obviously Jesus could not have been explaining the old law like some people contend. In fact, Matthew 5 and verse 32 simply does not fit into what the old law specified. In Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1, there it speaks of a man giving his wife a bill of divorcement because he had found some uncleanness, some uncleanness in her. This word here, uncleanness, refers to some indecency or unseemly thing. It's defined in other ways. Something shameful or a disgrace or something that is offensive. But you know, whatever it was, it must have been something repugnant or disgraceful. Let me point out that it is the same word that is used in Deuteronomy 23 and verse 14 where it seems to refer to sanitation rather than a moral offense. However, this much we know, it had to be less than adultery. Whatever he's talking about here in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1, some uh, uncleanness, it had to be less than adultery. How do we know that? Well, let me walk you through the different scenarios that are discussed under the law of Moses, and I think this becomes obvious. First of all, we see that the married woman who was caught in adultery, she was not divorced, but rather she died. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 22. Secondly, if an engaged woman committed adultery, both of them died. According to Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 through verse 24. Thirdly, if a newly married wife was accused of suspected premarital unchastity and she was found guilty, she was stoned to death. The Bible says... In Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 through verse 21, and incidentally, if she was found not guilty, God said that her husband could not put her away all the days of his life. Fourthly, if a man suspected his wife of adultery, there was a procedure, and certainly a strange one, that they were to go through to discover the truth, and if she was found guilty, it resulted in death, according to Numbers 5, verses 11 through verse 31. So notice what we have seen here. Clearly, Matthew 5 and 32 does not fit in the context of what the old law taught, because adultery under the law of Moses brought the penalty of death, not divorce. If they were guilty of adultery... A divorce was not the answer. They were stoned to death, if you please. And so the inescapable conclusion is that Jesus was giving His law in Matthew 5 and verse 32. Now, before we go any further, let's turn over to Matthew 19 and let's read verses 3 through verse 9. We've already looked at these verses in this uh, study. But let's turn over there and let's see what happens. In Matthew 19, beginning with verse 3. Of course, the Bible says on this occasion that the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And what does Jesus do? You know what's interesting? He doesn't go to the old law. He doesn't go to the book of Deuteronomy. What Jesus does is He goes to the book of Genesis. In other words, He goes back to the beginning to show what God's original intent was in regard to marriage. Verse 4, 
He said to them, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God have joined together, let not man put asunder. He takes them back to the beginning. And then they say to him in verse 7, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? They say, well, why is it then that Moses allowed this? He permitted this, if you please. Here's the answer, verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Now sometimes there's people say, well, Jesus never did answer their question. They wanted to know, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any and every reason? And they say, Jesus didn't answer. I submit unto you, Jesus did answer their question. His answer was yes. Yes, God permitted that. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But of course, from the beginning, it was not so. We've already talked about the idea. It was because of the hardness of their heart. You know, I think sometimes we underestimate the influence that our Savior has had upon this old world for good. And of course, in that day and time, under the old mosaical dispensation of time, the Messiah had not yet come. They didn't have the benefits of the life and the wonderful character and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And many of those Jewish men, you see, they were hardened in their hearts toward their wives. In other words, I believe what he's saying is some of them were mean. Some of them mistreated them. You know what the truth is? And the Old Testament shows this. They would divorce them if they wanted to for whatever reason. They might just decide their wife did not please them. They did not delight in them. It may have been the case they just got to the point to where they did not want to provide for their wife. And so they would divorce them. Now, of course, that was not God's original intention. But we have to understand that under the Mosaical Law, they were not living in the age of perfection, if you please, that we are living under the Gospel age because we're on this side of the cross and we have the benefits of the life and the character and the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what I'm trying to say is all of that has had such an effect that it has softened the hearts of men, or at least many people in this old world have been influenced by that. Jesus said, it was because of your hardness of hearts. That's the reason why God suffered this to be so. But then Jesus gives him, I believe, His law and His teaching on the matter that we're under tonight. In verse 9, when Jesus said, And I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now, what Jesus is doing here is He is showing what His law is in regard to to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And what I want to emphasize first of all, and I think here's where we need to first focus, Jesus gives a rule in regard to this. What is the rule? Listen, here's the rule. Jesus said, Whosoever shall put away his wife and shall marry another committeth adultery. That's his rule. And you know what? That's really what we need to emphasize. As it's already been said by Brother Allen, we need to emphasize, especially to our young people, listen, if you're thinking about and contemplating on getting married, or one of these days you will, you need to realize this is serious business. Don't go into a marriage thinking, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, we can just get a divorce and go our separate way. 
No, as, as Brother Allen pointed out, this is serious business and this is the rule. The rule is that whosoever shall put away his wife and shall marry another committeth adultery. In other words, Jesus is saying that marriage is supposed to be for life. It is until death do us part as we often take those vows. But now then, there is an exception. You see, and yes, we have to emphasize the exception at times because there are those who deny that there is one. What is the exception to the rule? Well, Jesus said, except it be for fornication. Now, fornication here is the Greek word pornea, and it is a general term that includes adultery. In fact, Thayer, in his Greek lexicon, he says that it is used of adultery in Matthew 5, verse 32, and Matthew 19, and verse 9. The New King James Version renders it as sexual immorality. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus here was referring to. So please let it sink in what Jesus plainly taught about the exception. Here's what Jesus plainly taught. He said the one who puts away his spouse for sexual immorality and marries another does not commit adultery. That's exactly what Jesus said. And you know what? If that's not the case, then really the exception in the statement that Jesus made means absolutely nothing. Let me give you a parallel to think about. Suppose someone was to make this statement. Suppose they said, whoever kills a man except in self-defense commits murder. According to this statement, if someone kills a man in self-defense, has he committed murder? Well, obviously the answer is no. Well, likewise, Jesus gave sexual immorality as an exception in regard to divorce and remarriage. Now, maybe someone is thinking to themselves, when are you going to get to your topic? When are you going to start talking about the guilty party. Well, I've been laying the groundwork. And I believe that what we have studied so far is going to help us zero in on how all of this affects the guilty party. And let me say something about this expression, the guilty party. I think there are some people that don't like that. Maybe you don't especially like the expression. And if you don't, I'll give you another expression. See if you like this one better. If you don't want to call them the guilty party, Call them the sexually immoral one and divorce for that reason. Does that sound better? That's who we're really talking about. We're talking about the sexually immoral one. They're the one who has brought immorality into this relationship and they are divorced for that reason. Now then, I've got a chart. I don't really use PowerPoint when I preach, but I've got this one chart that I'm going to use. And I think that I'll be able to demonstrate exactly who it is that Jesus has authorized to remarry. And I want to point out, I think this is a good way to approach this subject. This is the way I like to approach it. Whom did Jesus authorize to remarry? Now, you know, when it comes to other topics, we like to talk about what is authorized, don't we? When it comes to the worship of the church, don't we want to know what's authorized in the Scriptures? What is specified therein? What has the Lord authorized us to do? When it comes to the work, or when it comes to the organization of the church, we want to know what is authorized. That's important to us. How else are we going to determine what is right and what is scriptural and what isn't? Well, the question is, whom did Jesus authorize to have the right to remarry whenever a divorce takes place. And also, let me just tell you this, I'm going to do my best tonight to stick with what Jesus said. Now that's my intention. Now perhaps when we get into the question and answer period, I can imagine that somebody's going to want to know, well, what, what do we do if this happens? What about this particular circumstance? And uh, on and on it can go. But listen, my intention 
is to stay as closely to what Jesus said as I possibly can. Because if I can do that, I can know what is right beyond the shadow of a doubt. So let's look at this chart. Whom did Jesus authorize to remarry? Now listen, here's what Christ taught. Jesus taught that the one who puts away his spouse for sexual immorality and remarries does not commit adultery. We've already emphasized that. That's what he plainly declared in Matthew 19 verse 9. Now notice, this is the only person, let this sink in, this is the only person who is authorized to remarry. So what's the consequence? Look up here. The one who puts away his spouse for some other reason does not have the right of remarriage. He doesn't fit into this category. If I decide I just don't love my wife anymore and I don't want her and I just divorce her for incompatibility or whatever the case might be, the Lord hasn't authorized me to remarry. I haven't met this stipulation that He has given. Notice over there on the far right, the one who is put away for an unscriptural cause is not authorized to remarry. If I were to divorce Judy because I don't want her anymore, well, she's not authorized to remarry. I'm not authorized to remarry. She's not authorized to remarry because she didn't put me away for sexual immorality if I've not been guilty of that, you see. So the one put away for some other cause is not authorized to remarry. All right, here it is. What about the guilty party? Well, listen, the guilty party did not put their spouse away for sexual immorality, did they? No, they're the one who was put away for sexual immorality. The point is, this does not fit what Jesus said, because right there in the middle of that almost a circle there, Jesus indicates the only one who is authorized to remarry is the one who puts his spouse away for sexual immorality. So in regard to divorce and remarriage, the only one who is said to remarry without committing adultery, I'll repeat, the one who puts away their spouse for immorality, and nowhere does the Lord authorize the guilty party to remarry. Now listen, if the guilty party may remarry, really there is no reason, seems to me, for the exception in Matthew 19 and verse 9. Why do I say that? I say that because Jesus gave His teaching here to protect the innocent one. That's really the purpose of the exception. I think that's obvious because the exception uh, only gives the innocent person the right of remarriage. And you know, actually, when you think about it, Jesus gives no consideration to the one put away whatsoever. Absolutely none. All He says about the one who is put away is that whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Now I realize, of course, that some claim that the exception also applies to the second clause. But you know what? That is a mere assumption at best that cannot be proved. Hugo McCord, who was a Greek scholar in the Churches of Christ, and incidentally he produced his own translation of the New Testament, I think that is called the Everlasting Gospel. This man said this, and I quote, He said, In no Greek manuscript does the accepted phrase appear in the second clause. It just simply is not there. But, I know what somebody says. They say, well now, wait a minute. If one party in the previous marriage is free to remarry, then wouldn't both parties be free to remarry? If one is free, isn't the other one free? Well, you know, I want to deal with that argument. And I want to show you some of the fallacies that are involved in it. Now, first of all, there are those who like to illustrate it with a pair of shoes or handcuffs. You ever see that? Remember when I was just a young preacher one time, I was at a certain place, and there was a man who was arguing with me, and he took the position that the guilty party could remarry. 
And you know what he did? He took off his shoes. He took them off. And then he took the shoelaces of both shoes, you know, and he tied them together. And he said, see there? Both of these shoes are bound. They're bound to each other. And then he loosed them and he untied those shoelaces. And then he took one of his shoes and put it over here and put the other one over here. And he said, now you see, if one is loose, then both of them are loose. If one is free, then both of them are free. And of course, his argument was, that's the way it has to be in this particular case right here. I want to answer that argument. I want to point out, first of all, that it is based upon an assumption. And the assumption is that if someone is in an unmarried state, then they are free to remarry. And I want to tell you this evening, that is absolutely not true. Did you know that a person can be in an unmarried state and not necessarily be authorized to remarry? In fact, they're even forbidden to do so. Now we've already in this study gone to 1 Corinthians 7. Let's go over there again. And I want to read 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10 and verse 11. Now Paul in this chapter is dealing with marriage. He's dealing with different scenarios. Evidently, the Corinthians had written him some questions about marriage, and he's dealing with each of these issues. As I read verses 10 and 11, we have to understand that in these two verses, he's dealing with a situation where both of them are believers. Both of them have obeyed the gospel. They are both children of God. How do I know that? I know that because in the next two verses... He's going to speak to another group of people and it has to do with the situation where one is a believer and the other is an unbeliever. In other words, there's an unbeliever involved. That's when he says, but to the rest speak I, uh, uh, not the Lord. Well, we're dealing here in verses 10 and 11 where it's different than that because both of them are believers. Now listen to what he says. He says, and unto the married I command, yet not I, now listen, but the Lord. He's dealing with a situation that has to do with two believers. And Paul said, what I'm about to tell you really doesn't come from me. It comes from the Lord. You know what he's saying? He's saying the Lord's already dealt with this. Where did Jesus deal with that? Well, obviously... In Matthew 5, 32 and Matthew 19 and 9 and his teaching on the subject. What did the Lord say when he dealt with this? He says, let not the wife depart from her husband. Incidentally, that word depart means divorce. That's the way that Thayer defines it. And we're going to see here in a moment that agrees with the context. Really what he's dealing with here is he's dealing with two believers and a divorce might take place, could take place, but it's not for the exception. See? It's not because one of them has committed sexual immorality because he's applying the law of Jesus in regard to this. So he says, let not the wife depart from her husband. Don't divorce your husband. But I guess Paul knew that there's probably some people for whatever reason are going to go ahead and do it anyway. So what did he say? He says, but, and if she depart, listen now, let her remain what? Let her remain unmarried. I suggest to you that proves that he was talking about divorce. Because a divorce has taken place, and as a result, they are in an unmarried state. And Paul says, if you are divorced and sexual immorality was not involved, you did not meet the exception, you have one of two alternatives. There's one of two things that you must do. You must either remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. What have we shown? We have shown that it is possible for a person to be in an unmarried state, but that does not necessarily mean that they have the right to marry unless the Lord has authorized them to do that. Secondly, and here's what I really want to emphasize. You know, the shoes and the handcuffs illustration are not 
a true parallel. And the reason is because there is another party involved. See, in that illustration, you've just got two shoes and, and that's it. But you see, when we're talking about marriage, there is someone else involved in this relationship. You know who it is? It's God. That's who it is. God. And He has His law that governs the marriage relationship. That is what is missing in those two illustrations. Now, turn with me, and we've looked at these verses as well, over to Romans 7, and let's read verses 1 through verse 3. And I think Paul gives us some things really here to think about. Romans 7 beginning with verse 1. He says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. My understanding is actually he's saying, I'm speaking to those that know law. Because the definite article the is not there. In other words, what he's saying is, you understand law. You understand the principle of law. You know how it works and how it operates. How that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now listen to what he says. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. I submit unto you, he's referring to Christ's law, if you please, right here, in regard to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And notice he says here that according to this general rule, she's bound to this law as long as her husband is living. But of course, if her husband dies, what did he say? Now listen to what he says. If he be dead, she is loose from the law, listen, of her husband. The law of her husband. I think what he means by that is the law pertaining to her husband. That's how the New American Standard Bible renders that. I want you to notice what Paul did not say. Paul did not say that if her husband is dead, she's loose from her husband. That's not what he says here. Now that would be true. But he says something more than that. He says she is loose from the law of her husband. The law pertaining to her husband. What is that law? Well, if you boil it all down, the law of Christ is... There is to be one husband to one wife. There is to be one man to one woman for life. And again, we need to understand that is true. That we take that vow until death do us part. Now, based on what Paul has said here, I want to draw some conclusions. Now follow me very closely. If an unscriptural divorce takes place, I am in a mar an unmarried state. I want you to think about that. Judy and I can get divorced over whatever. Neither one of us committed adultery. And you know what? When we get a divorce, we are in an unmarried state. That's what Paul said. That's exactly what he said. As we read from 1 Corinthians 7, I am in an unmarried state. And you know what? I can marry another. I can do that. Now, I don't have the right to do it, but I can. Remember Jesus said, What God have joined together, let not man put asunder. Can man put asunder what God has joined together? Well, I reckon he can. If he can, I don't know why Jesus would make the statement. And then he went on to say, And marry another. Could I divorce Judy for whatever and then marry another? Yes, I can do that. I could do it. And there are people that do that. But of course, I'm doing something that I am not unauthorized or I'm not authorized to do. Why? Why am I not authorized to do that? Here's the reason. The reason is because I am still bound by the law of the husband, as Paul put it. I'm in an unmarried state, 
but I am still bound to that law. As I said, this is Christ's law in regard to the matter. And I know that because Paul repeats this law in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39. And that's why that I must conclude that the guilty party does not have the scriptural cause for divorce and remarriage because they are in violation of Christ's law and they are still held accountable to it. And so let me explain what it comes down to. And I think really we need to shuck the corn, if you please, and really get to the heart of the issue. Here's what it comes down to tonight. If I divorce and remarry without the exception being the reason that I put away my spouse, that second marriage constitutes an adulterous relationship. And you know what? If I want to be right with God, I'm going to have to sever myself from it. If the second marriage constitutes adultery, as Jesus said it did, then obviously the relationship itself is flawed and it must be renounced. You know what? That's the reason why that there are those who have tried to redefine adultery. They've actually given it a new definition. They want to define it as simply meaning covenant breaking. They say that's, that's what adultery is that Jesus is talking about. It's just covenant breaking. And of course that would make it a one time act. But this redefining of adultery is without authority and is merely an attempt to justify the unjustifiable. As far as I know, no lexicographer will define adultery in Matthew 5.32 or Matthew 19 verse 9 as covenant breaking. In other words, as just the mere act of getting a divorce. Now since marriage involves a physical union, it's obvious that Jesus is not using adultery in a figurative sense, but He was using it in the ordinary sense of the term. Will anyone deny that the remarriage referred to in Matthew 19 and verse 9 is marriage in the usual, ordinary sense of that term? Will anybody deny that? Well, if it is... If it is marriage in the ordinary sense of the term, then the adultery referred to is adultery in the usual ordinary sense. And I like the way one man put it, and this is kind of blunt, but maybe we need to, as I said, we need to shuck the corn down sometimes. You know how he put it? He said adultery is not committed at the courthouse, but rather adultery is committed in the bedroom. And you know what? That, that's exactly right. Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a sexual sin. Also, my understanding is that committeth. In Matthew 19 and verse 9, when Jesus said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. That word committeth there is in the present tense in the Greek. And it seems to me that it denotes continuous action. In other words, he's saying they keep on committing adultery. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they're still bound to the law of the husband, if you please, that did not allow them to get into that adulterous relationship to begin with. All right, I've got a little over five minutes left. So what I want to do is, I want to kind of tie up some loose ends, if I may. Let me say, first of all, that in regard to the guilty party, I don't believe that Christ's law is simply meant to punish. I don't really believe that's the main point. Although, obviously, they're suffering the consequences of their sins. And you know, there are sins that bring consequences. That's especially true of a sin like adultery. But I don't think that's the main point at all. I think really the purpose of Christ's teaching in regard to all this is to protect that sanctity of the marriage relationship. I think that's really what He's trying to do. Listen to me tonight. It's not good. It's not good for man to be able to just sweep marriage away as if it is nothing. To just treat it in such a flippant fashion. It is to man's good 
if you please, that marriage be held to such a high standard. And I believe for the most part, that's why Jesus has given this law that He has given. And I want you to think about this. While some may think it is unfair when applied to their particular situation, and I realize that, and listen, I think we could come up with situations, actual circumstances, and yet the wife or maybe the husband doesn't have the right of remarriage, and we would say that is unfair. And you know what? From a human standpoint, I'd have to admit that's true, but that's not really the point. Really, Jesus is not concerned about fairness as we perceive it to be, but again, it is the sanctity of marriage that is at the forefront of His teaching. And it's for our good. It's for the good of society that that sanctity of marriage be held in such a great high esteem as our Savior did. So really we have looked at this issue in a comprehensive way, as much as I know how to do it. In regard to the specific point of the guilty party, he's not authorized to remarry. He just simply is not. And therefore, Jesus said, whoever marries her that is put away doth commit adultery. Why? Well, the reason is because they are still bound by what Paul called the law pertaining to the husband. I'm going to stop right there. And we're ready now, Lord willing, for the questions.